Welcome back, viewers. It's James Com, your half-assed reporter, and we are back for a rolling review. We're down on Orchard Street, and uh, well, interestingly enough, uh, this has been billed as the latest hot art district, and uh, probably about uh, two or three years ago, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 galleries on this street. And uh, as I come back, the 2016 fall season, I see that there are many former gallery spaces that are closed and they're trying to rent them. So strangely enough, the Lower East Side finds itself in a position of growing as an art district and also collapsing at the same time due to the success of the the hipsters and the gallerists moving in. So much for the editorial comment. Now we're gonna run into McKenzie and we're gonna take a look at a show by Gary Peterson called something like On the Backside of the Sun. Well, tell us what the title of the show is. Uh, back There Behind the Sun back there behind the sun mm -hmm. and these are all new paintings i know that uh we actually 2016 there's one from 2015 which is uh almost square which we'll come to this one was started in 2015 but it finished off in 2016 and then everything else since 2016. We saw a show of yours, what was it, a year and a half ago at uh, Theodore Art out in yeah, Bushwick? Yeah, 2015. Something like uh, that? Uh, two big wall paintings. That's right. And, uh, several, probably about eight small paintings. That was Stephanie's brilliant idea, which I loved. She approached me a couple of years ago about doing a wall painting, and I said, sure. And then she said, oh, we should include some small work to play off of the large wall painting. All right, that's why I thought this would be interesting because we get a chance to see some of the uh, larger scale pieces. And uh, as I remembered, most of the pieces in that show were on panel, but uh, I think yeah. these are all on, on canvas, is that correct. correct? All on canvas. There are five 12 inch square panel paintings. Um, really, the first time I've worked on a square as well. I normally don't work on squares. And that came out of a little show a couple years ago called Squared. <laughs> and, uh, and people were actually showing challenge. square paintings in a show called Squared? <laughs> yeah. And I took the challenge and I like working with it. So when um, approaching this show, I thought it would be fun to include some of those squares. As well as a horizontal painting, which we'll get to, which I rarely do. Tell us what the title of this piece is. This is called Slip Spill. Slip spill. Okay, this sounds like the things I'm talking about to my uh, orthopedist, <laughs> my, my uh, spine guy. That knee kind of slips and spills. Uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed, let's move on down, uh, yep. and, and this piece is, don't tell me, seven by five feet, something like that? Uh, what is this? 84, 84 by 60, oh, 63, okay. <laughs> One of the reasons that I wanted to uh, kind of come in and talk to you about this is that um, I noticed that you kind of uh, had uh, gone in a little different direction, a little uh, change in some of the paintings. And I think this is a kind of a good example we can look at. You know, you've got these kind of uh, blocks, almost like bricks that you're uh, working with. And some of the other pieces, they were maybe larger forms that uh, sort of commanded the space more individually. And, and I just like this because uh, it gave you a chance to uh, kind of play with the colors like you were mm -hmm. orchestrating some kind of a little jazz riff or something. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about your, your colors and your ideas about color theory, if you have any? No color theory, but it, it's all come out very intuitively. I always tell the story when I was in grad school, uh, a sculptor I had looked at me and kind of discussed and said, you should take a color theory course. And I know- The sculptor told you to look at yeah. a color theory course, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I did not take that advice. 
And I think that was good that I did not because I developed my own voice with the color. Um, where it comes from? Yeah, that's what I need. Really that was the second is, question. You know, from one's uh, childhood is very important and, you know, our generation with television, cartoons, you know, the millennial generation with right. more computer, computer based games, uh, cell phones and stuff like, like that. that. Yes. Um, you know, there's a big influence of that kind of uh, uh, Disney World, California. Electric color. Cartoons, things like that. Yeah, yeah screen uh, color. Even though I grew up in New York, I'm very attracted to it. Do we have a title for this piece? Good question. There is a title. You know, that's why. Bounce Back. <laughs> Bounce Back. Oh, yeah. Bounce Back. back. Okay. I have to ask the dealer. I can't remember all my That's why a lot of people just number them or untitled. And all of these pieces are acrylic? Is that what we're looking yeah, at? Yeah, everything is acrylic now. And I know that you were... time I was using acrylic and oil, and that was... When I was at the Sharp Residency, I was developing this vocabulary, and I would white it out with um, oil paint. And then come back, obviously, with oil Like titanium top. white or white no, lead or... No, titanium white. Just a really beautiful veil. But it became problematic with drying times, and I wasn't, you know... And then you're painting on top of that with acrylic? No, no, no. I'm using oil then on top of that. Oh, okay. But it'd be... I, and that was a little bit of me transitioning into acrylics, because prior to 2010, I was primarily an oil painter. Oh. Um, and understanding acrylics, what I could do with it. Um, and it took a couple of years, but I'm totally now an acrylic painter. Now, here is a beautiful little suite of... Uh... Three, I guess these are squares. Yeah, these are all 12 inch and squares. And this is actually the group of pieces that I noticed that there was kind of a new, kind of a uh, format that you were working with, the blocks well, and- the uh, blocks are opening up with holes in them. Yeah. And these lines are uh, ink lines. So a bit of drawing uh, and painting uh, coming together. Um, so it just adds another dimension to the work. You know, the other thing that I was going to say, you were talking about color, and uh, I'm a big fan of color. Sure. But I was looking at this particular suite of pieces, and it made me think of uh, some of the great 1950s graphic artists, you know, that would be doing these beautiful illustrations for something like Life magazine or something, but they would have these kinds of uh, beautiful kind of tertiary colors. And I thought that some of this made me made me think of that. Sure, I mean, I think it's definitely there from one's background. I'm still attracted to that. So these little these these light lines on a section like that is that that color, or did you put a, a layer of no, white paint over top a of that? No, this is a layer of uh, white. Okay, Correct. so you've got so it. it's multiple layers. I'll I'll do like in this one, you can sort of see there's uh, blocky quadrilaterals. Here. Yes, so that and lighter tone is just a and then I white it out. A, and then I may, on top of that, add more Please. lines okay. and then white it out again. So it's almost like with this, I'm doing a complete painting underneath and then it gets whited out. And then these blocks come in working off of it as if these lines were some sort of skeleton or scaffolding or something like that. So I'm both playing with it and uh, obliterating it at the same time. You know, the other thing I like about the work, and uh, I kind of miss this with uh, a lot of other, I guess what I would call more formalistic uh, painters that are dealing with a lot of colors is that a lot of times I see people and they're making these pieces, they're abstract, they're colored, but it's like uh, they're all playing in the middle of the keyboard. And what I like about a lot of your work, especially in this show, is that you're really, you're using the whole keyboard. You're going from the, the bass to the darks up to the, the very lights and everything in, in between. Mm. So, I mean, for my money, it's like listening to a nice, we're talking about jazz music, it's nice, you've got the bass and then you've got the, mm -hmm. oh, the nice. clarinet or the flute player at the top and, uh, and, and then you've got the people in the middle or the colors in the middle sort of uh, carrying the melody. Mm -hmm. Do we know what the title of this one is? <laughs> uh, Valerie, all right, we'll just consider it. Wait, 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 this is, oh man. <laughs> Yeah, what is the title of that one? Slipstream 2. Oh, that's Slipstream 2. 
Now, on some of these lines, are you using, using a lot of masking tape on this, or...? Uh, yes, I use that high-quality Japanese tape. High-quality Japanese tape? Yes. Okay. Not just your Home Depot variety. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, don't, that, don't, don't say anything bad about Home Depot masking tape. I used to get it at New York Central, who, who they closed. Yeah, well, getting it at between Pearl Paint Central. and New York Central, everybody's kind of... Yeah. Closing or being sucked up by giant multinational corporations. Uh, so this is new for me, doing the horizontal. As you know, most everything has been vertical format. Even my early work in the 90s was tall, thin, vertical paintings. Rarely did I do horizontals. This is another real nice little uh, piece. Uh, what I was going to ask you is, uh, and like I said, this might be a bit of a sandbag question, but uh, a lot of people ask me about formalism. What exactly is formalism, formalist abstraction? But in certain ways, I would say that, would you consider yourself a formalist? No, I think I'm playing with it. I guess I think of formalism of removing the voice of the artist from the work. And this has so much of my personality and voice in it. Um, but I play off of it, I play with it, bring a sense of humor, and playfulness into geometry that maybe isn't often there. In the so you would, for you, formalism is pretty much involved with a very reductive kind of uh, geometry? Would that be a kind of your definition? Hmm. Not only is it reductive, but again, when you don't have a personality or voice in the work, that you're just using the formal vocabulary and just Just playing with the space. To me, this has a lot more character in it. Besides doing formal, interesting things with space and playing around with it and zooming and color. So a nice little pair of squares. Mm -hmm. But you do mostly work with pretty much geometric forms. Say this yeah. arc here that we've got across the middle, this magenta arc. Do you use a, uh, a compass or a, a French curve or something to get that? Or is that sort of freehand that you sort of you maybe free clean hand, up? No. <laughs> You're using instruments? Using actually tape, drawing with tape. So if I set the tape down very thin, you know the very thin tape you use when you sure. do on cars. And you can sort of lay that down and, and almost draw with it. And then if it's not quite right, pull it off, rather than using, uh, you know, an arc or a... So, a so, so this arc here is not calculated to, no. you know, part of a part of like arc a of a sphere or, or something, something like, like that yeah, that no. relates to the proportion no, it's just of the taking square. It literally as if I was going to draw a line, like so, but I'll just use the tape to draw it. And then uh, you get such a nice pristine surface on here, do you... Uh, do you sand these at all, or you just have a particular medium that you use to keep everything nice and you mean in terms of the slick? Well, I'm talking about the the facture of the the brush stroke. Uh, oh, within the, the yeah, within the, the planes. You no, know, just um, you know, mix a medium into it and uh, uh, work a very nice uh, touch. It's the artist's touch. And you have to have the right brushes, you know, not uh, yes. bristly. And the high-quality Japanese masking and high tape. And this <laughs> high-quality Japanese brushes, too? Or? They're not Japanese brushes, oh, but they're okay. good brushes. And do we have a title for this piece? The title? Yeah. Uh, staring at the just, Sun. Just to make it crazy. Yeah. Staring at the Sun. Staring at the Sun. Uh, and I think... Stop. Staring at the Sun. Staring at the sky. The other thing I talked about maybe in the last show was that uh, I like the uh, the incidences of the linear things happening at the edges of the forms and even on the edges of the canvas. Mm -hmm. What are your think? What is your thinking about that? Uh, you well, know the so importance of the edge of things. You, you know it's an edge. You know this is a stretched canvas. You're acknowledging that. At times playing off of it. At times knowing that it goes off the edge. Right, so so, uh, so this like this magenta line is the edge of the 
kind of the salmon yeah. form, and then I mean, it goes on in its own section. A lot better than I could speak about it. He wrote it beautifully about playing with the edge and acknowledging it and um, contradicting it at the same time. So. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess that was it, Gary. So we're here on a uh, Sunday afternoon. Today is October 9th? Yes. No. October 9th. So we have one at, week. At Mackenzie? October 16th. 55? Is that at 55 Orchard Street? Right. Here on the Lower East Side. And uh, well, thank you all. And as always, join me, folks. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.